very, very warm welcome to everyone this morning. And if you're here visiting for the first time, a big special welcome to you. Uh, and to uh, remind you, or to invite you, uh, we have coffee and tea uh, and biscuits um, in the hall at the end of the service. Um, and if you would like to stop and have a chat with us all, or some of us, we'd be very, very pleased to see you. So if you would like to join us afterwards, that would be brilliant. So I know of other notices today, so it gives me great pleasure to um, ask Tanya. Thank you to lead our worship this morning. Over to you, Thank you. Good morning. It's a real joy to share worship with you this morning. My theme today is God without limits. God with no boundaries, nothing containing him. And I have a call to worship which I'd like us all to join in, to, in, in together to. And the word should be on the screen.
praise, thanksgiving and confession now. There is a response in this prayer and I forgot to put the, get the words put on the screen but hopefully you've all got good memories. When I say loving God for all that you have given us, your response is we praise and worship you. Loving God for all that you have given us, we praise and worship you. Almighty and wonderful God, you're so much greater than we can possibly imagine. We may try to see you in our minds, to box you into our own world of you, but you are so much bigger, beyond our understanding and high above us. So we come today to give you our worship and our praise and to make our confession. Loving God, for all that you have given us, we praise and worship you. Thank you, God, for the variety of all that you've created. So much beauty in the world around us, the trees, the flowers, the mountains, so many different species of animals and wildlife, the verdant pastures for animals to graze in, the sunrise at the beginning of each day, and the sunset at its ending. Loving God, for all that you have given us, we praise and worship you. <coughs> Forgive us our pride and our arrogance for the destruction that we have helped to wreak upon all that you have created. For thinking that we know best and ignoring your guidance. For not seeing the hurts that we cause to others by our greed and our selfishness, for boxing you in and failing to recognise that your ways aren't our ways and your thoughts aren't our thoughts. Loving God, for all that you have given us, we praise and worship you. Almighty and wonderful God, Forgive us for ignoring you so much. Forgive us when we fail to see the suffering of others and when we conveniently forget the suffering and death of your dear son Jesus for the forgiveness of the wrong that we do in your world. Thank you for his glorious resurrection and the gift to each one of us of your Holy Spirit so that you're always with us. Loving God, for all that you have given us, you. Almighty God, remind us that you always have more to say, to do, and to reveal to us. Give us the strength and the courage to always be aware that we are tasked with being your hands and your feet in this world. Forgive us for our failings and truly open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to who and what you are through your Holy Spirit working in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And Sylvia is going to bring us our first greeting. Thank you, Sylvia. First reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 1 to 14. Now when King David was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of Eden, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, 
whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? <clears throat> now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture and from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and not be disturbed any more. And evil doers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make your house. When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish this kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's better. Sorry, we get it right. Right, so some of you have been camping. Any of the grown ups been camping? Yeah? What did you think of it? How did it make you feel? Anyone got an answer? I'm coming over. Great, but it wasn't raining. Absolutely. Well, in that reading, the word of God had been carried in a tent all through the wilderness when the Israelites were, or when they left Egypt. Um, you may vaguely remember the plagues and things like that, and eventually they managed to get out of Egypt. But David, having settled, built his house. Who's built a house? Anybody built a house? No, no builders here, that's fine, that's fine. David had built his house and he felt a bit guilty. He'd got a house, but God's commandments, God, as the people saw him, was still living in that tent that they travelled in. And he felt that that was wrong. Do you know who King David was? Who was King David? Did you do the story of David and Goliath a few weeks ago? Anybody know the story of David and Goliath? What happened? David was a boy then, and he was the one that, with his slingshot, actually killed Goliath the giant. And God promised him that eventually he would become king. So by the time we get to this reading today, David has become the king, and he wants to show his authority by building a temple, a house for God. So, the prophet Nathan thought, initially, that's a good idea. But then God said, I don't want you to do that. I want you to look after my people, to guide my people, and not actually worry about God living in a tent. What, where do you think God does live? Any answers over there? How do you feel about where God is? Is he in this building today? Yeah? Is he in your heart? Yeah, yeah. yeah? Great. I'm glad you said that. But God is all around us. It doesn't matter. 
where he is. We can't put him in a box or in a building. He's always with us. And it's really important that each one of us remembers that. And it's important for you young people too. You can talk to God wherever you are at any time. It doesn't matter about being in church. It doesn't matter where you are. You can do it right, talk to God riding your bike or whatever, walking in the park. God is always there. God wants a relationship with us and he wants to listen to us and to respond. And he responds in ways sometimes that we don't quite understand just by the little things that happen in our lives from day to day. And it's just important that we take that on board and realise that he is always with us. Thank you. And I think young people are leaving us now and you usually have a blessing that comes up on the screen. So here it comes, I think. Right. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Go in peace. Thank you. Enjoy your, your lessons or whatever you're doing. Let us build a house where love can dwell.
and David is going to bring us the first one. Thank you. So this is a part of Psalm 89. It's a long psalm, but we have our verses here. I have found my servant David, with my holy oil I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him, my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, the wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Forever I will keep my steadfast love for him, and my covenant with him will stand firm. I will establish his line forever and his throne as long as the heavens endure. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my ordinances, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will, pun pun then I will punish their transgressions with the, with the rod and their iniquity with scourges, but I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. <clears throat> Once and for all I have sworn by, him, by my holiness. I will not lie to David. His line shall continue forever and his throne endure, be endure before me like the sun. It shall be established forever like the moon, an enduring witness in the skies. Thank you, David and Barbara. We're going to sing another. 
a temporary dwelling place for the God who travelled with them on their journey. As their king, David wanted to consolidate his authority by providing the people with a magnificent temple in which to worship God. And of course, as we said, he discussed it with the prophet, prophet Nathan. Good idea, maybe. But then, of course, Nathan was warned by God that that wasn't what he wanted from David. That it wasn't necessary to contain him in a building. And God went on to remind him of all the things that he had done, both for David and the Jewish people. David, the lowly shepherd boy, had become a king. He was loved by God, often despite his appalling behaviour. And he was assured of his protection from his enemies. And the Jewish people are free, back in their own land. It may seem strange to us that David only thought of creating solid buildings, both for himself and for God to live in. And centuries later, we see Peter having the same sort of ideas to David at the transfiguration of Jesus and wanting to build shelters for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Matthew 17, verse 4 states, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Perhaps both Peter and David were equally impulsive and longed for some permanent structure in their lives in response to previously itinerant lifestyles. I wonder if sometimes, like David and Peter, we have what seems to be a great idea, but we plunge headfirst into something without prayerful consideration or waiting for God's guidance. As we said earlier, we so often try to box God in, to mould him into our ways, rather than waiting for him to lead us in his ways. God, through Nathan, went on to thwart David's plan and to reveal David's destiny which was to build a dynasty, starting with Solomon, who did build a temple for God so that people could work out there. And that led eventually to the birth of God's son Jesus to Mary, who was a direct descendant of David and that dynasty. The final verses of that first reading predict that God himself would build his house, or indeed his kingdom, through his son Jesus, that descendant of David, as we often sing in the Christmas carol that shepherds watched. To you in David's town this day is born of David's line a saviour who is Christ the Lord. And just a reminder of those final words from that reading from 2 Samuel 7, the Lord declares that you to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I'll raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'll be his father. He will be my son. Our second reading from Psalm 89 is just a reminder of God's covenant and promises to David and an assurance that it will never be broken. In the annual Methodist Covenant service, we collectively make our own response to God in acceptance and response to his promises to us throughout the Bible. I quote, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us and the call to love and serve God in all our life and work. In the covenant prayer which follows, we say, I willingly offer all that I have and am to serve you 
as and where you choose. The sharing of the word of God and the love of Jesus isn't just a task for ministers, pastors and preachers, but for each and every Christian who is a part of the church, the body of Christ. I have Christian friends who are actually in all of our covenant service because it makes so clear our responsibilities as Christians and they've actually taken the full service of or the covenant prayer to use in their own churches which I think is wonderful. Psalm 89 also predicts David's destiny in a similar way to our first reading from Samuel. But it also offers words of caution in verse 30 to 32. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. God is simply saying that when his people turn away from him, they will suffer and be chastened, as a parent punishes a naughty child. But verses 33 and 34 go on to speak of God's unconditional love for David and all the generations who follow him. That includes you and me. But I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. <coughs> I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. God's promises to David were of course fulfilled in the birth and the life of Jesus. In Luke 1 verse 32 to 33 we're told, He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The same covenant by God to David and the generations after him, of course, applies equally to us today. Through Jesus, we're never separated from the love of God. And that's what's made so clear in our third reading from Ephesians 2, which tells us that all people, regardless of race, religion or creed, are brought together. Barriers are broken down through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and through the gift of God's Holy Spirit. If we are tempted at any time to think that God has failed us or rejected us or simply doesn't love us, we couldn't be more wrong. Indeed, in John 15 verse 13 we're reminded of God's love for us through the sacrifice of Jesus. Greater love has no one than this that someone laid down his life for his friends. It's part of our human nature to try to visualise God in ways that make sense to us. I imagine that each one of us has a different picture of him in our own minds. But what's important is that we don't try to domesticate God, to box him in because of that. Even Solomon's prayer when, when the temple that David had wanted to build was actually built and dedicated in 1 Kings 8, verse 7, 27, was the heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built. Solomon's words. The words of the 19th century hymn written by John Mason Neal allude to the Ephesians reading and tell us Christ is the sure foundation, Christ the head, the cornerstone, chosen of the Lord and precious, binding all the church in one. Those words make it clear that the church means the, build, the people and not the buildings. We can't contain God in our buildings, although I sometimes wonder if we are tempted to forget when we end our worship in our church building on some days. We can only wonder that our uncontainable God can and does 
work in our lives when we allow him to do so. The word cornerstone seems almost contradictory in relation to Jesus if we think it in term, of it in terms of a solid building where it's something static. But it's also foundational, the primary support to the building, just as Jesus is to our faith in God. But Jesus wasn't static in any sense, simply a whirlwind of activity throughout the three short years of his ministry as he travelled throughout Israel and beyond, preaching, healing, performing miracles, <coughs> teaching those immediate twelve disciples and others close to him so that they could carry on his work and tell the world of his message from God, of love, of joy, hope and healing and peace for all people. There weren't any barriers to his ministry. Nobody was excluded. He met and dined with the hated tax collectors. He spoke with the Samaritan woman at the well and asked for water and told her that he knew her life story. He healed those suffering from leprosy, even though they were considered to be unclean. He healed the daughter of the Roman soldier without even going to see her because of the soldier's great faith. And so on. So many stories in the Gospels when we read them. As I was preparing for this service today, I looked at some of the other lecturing readings. Most of you probably know the lecturing is a three-year series of readings. And there are a number to look at each week if we choose to do so. But I looked at the reading from Mark chapter 6, and there were two verses there which spoke volumes of that frenetic activity of Jesus and the demands that people made on him at that time. In Mark 6, verse 34, he saw a great crowd and had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And then on to verse 56 where he went into villages, cities and farms. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might even touch the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Just a glimpse of that exhaustive activity, frequently punctuated by Jesus needing to get away and to spend time with his father in prayer. Perhaps that begs the question that as 21st century Christians we've become too comfortable, too complacent, maybe too insular within our church buildings, these solid walls around us. Do we take time in prayer to actually discern what God wants of us? Is our outreach to a world in chaos sufficient for its needs? If it isn't, how do we change that? What do we need to do? That's simply food for thought and prayer, and not a question that I'm going to begin to try to answer today. Finally, you'll be pleased to know. In verses 19 to 22 of our reading from Ephesians 2, 2, we're both reminded and reassured that we are an integral part of the building of God's kingdom on earth with the words, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. <coughs> Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 verse 50, 
for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister. God, our God has no boundaries. His power is unlimited. He truly is God without limits. And today, I urge each one of us to pray, to discern what God really wants of us, and to act upon it, drawing on the power of his Holy Spirit. Each one of us is a child of God, and in him too, we too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. I hope those words resonate with each one of us here today. Amen. And we will have our opportunity to prayer now. Thank you, Helen. God of love, we offer you our monetary gifts, however they're delivered. We offer you our worship, often imperfect though it is. We offer you our faith, perhaps not as strong as it should be. And we offer you our love, poor though it is compared to yours. God of love, take all that we offer you today and use it in ways beyond our imagination, for your kingdom and your glory. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again now. And it's number 161 we sing in the faith. You are using the hymn books. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. If you're able to, let's stand and sing again.
our prayers for others. There is a response, the usual one, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, just as you rescued the people of Israel from slavery, setting them free to worship and serve you, you've rescued us, setting us free from the slavery of sin, and selfishness and inviting us into relationship with you and with one another. So we thank and praise you for your love, grace and the mercy you have shown towards us. You call us to love and serve you by loving and serving our brothers and sisters near and far away. To put their needs and interests ahead of our own, and so to fulfil your law of love, we offer our prayers for the world which you created. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for world leaders, those with power and influence, wherever they are, and we pray especially for our new government and newly elected MPs, that they, each one of them, may use their position wisely and with compassion and understanding for all people. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for all people who don't have what they need in order to survive. Not enough food, water, medical care, shelter or security. We think of the people affected by recent hurricanes in the Caribbean. We think of the situation in Palestine and the Ukraine and so many other countries torn apart by war and terrorism where innocent people live in fear and suffer unimaginable horrors and often starvation. We pray for all those who've died and all who've lost loved ones in those conflicts. We pray too for the warmongers and the terrorists that their hearts may be softened and changed and that they may see the pain and the suffering that they bring to others and seek peaceful ways to bring about change. Open our hearts to see the needs in our world and to respond with your love. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. We pray for those who are living with serious illness or injury, who face each day with uncertainty or with pain, and especially those known to us who are sick or suffering. For those who find themselves wondering what the future holds, open our hearts to see the needs of all around us and to respond with love. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. <coughs> we think of those who have no work, those on low incomes, those with serious debt problems who are struggling to provide for themselves and their families, and those who are in despair of ever finding employment again for whatever reason. We pray for refugees everywhere, whether they're running from the horrors of persecution and war, or simply seeking better lives for themselves and their families open our hearts to see their needs and to respond with your love. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for your church, the body of Christ on earth. And we pray especially for this church and for Tony, our minister. We pray that we would all be a living example of your love in our world treating one another with compassion.
compassion and respect, settling differences with love and integrity, bound together by our common allegiance to you. Open our hearts to see one another and to respond with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the way of love shown to us by Jesus Christ, your Son. Open our hearts and our lives to your ongoing presence among us, so that we may grow in faithfulness and love and draw closer to you. Say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and based on Charles Wesley's Bible words, of course. Best of all is God is with us. God will hold and never fall, fail. Keep that truth when storms are raging. God remains, though faith is free. <coughs> Great to let's stand and sing again. Thank you. <coughs>